Welcome to part three of the series, The Abrahamic Promises as a Foundation for the Gospel of the Kingdom. In parts one and two, we establish the details of the first two of three promises God made to Abraham, the promise of land and the promise of descendants. In this installment, we'll delve into the third promise, the promise of blessing to all nations. In parts one and two, it was shown how that actual physical land was promised. However, Abraham, his son Isaac, and grandson Jacob all died not actually possessing that land, despite the promise being made directly to them and their descendants. Despite the Hebrew people returning to the promised land over 400 years later from Egypt, their tenure in the land experienced numerous interruptions and cannot accurately be described as eternal or everlasting. What is truly remarkable in contemporary times is the re-establishment of the nation of Israel in 1948. Prior to this event, the Jewish community had been dispersed worldwide following the first Jewish-Roman War that started in 66 AD, the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, and the final complete defeat of the Jewish rebellion at the fortress of Masada in 73 AD. This meant that for more than 1800 years, the Jewish people lived without a homeland and without any possession of the promised land. Despite their return to their homeland in 1948, the promise God made to Abraham and his descendants has still not completely been fulfilled. And how could it be? After all, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are dead. In fact, millions upon millions of Abraham's descendants are long past deceased. Hebrews 11, 8 through 13 tells us frankly, Through faith, Abraham responded to the divine call to leave his homeland and venture into an unknown place, which was destined to become his inheritance. He embarked on this journey without a clear destination in mind. By faith, he took up residence in the land of promise, even though it felt like a foreign land to him. He lived in tents alongside his heirs, Isaac and Jacob, who shared the same promises. His gaze was fixed on the city with unshakable foundations, a city designed and constructed by God himself. Similarly, Sarah, through her unwavering faith, received the miraculous ability to conceive, despite being well past the age of childbearing. Her faith rested in the trustworthiness of the one who had made the promise. As a result, from a man who was as good as dead in terms of fertility, descendants emerged as numerous as the stars in the sky and the countless grains of sand along the seashore. These faithful individuals, Abraham, Sarah, and their descendants, all passed away with their faith intact never fully realizing the promises during their lifetimes. However, they saw these promises from a distance, greeted them with joy, and acknowledged that they were merely temporary residents and foreigners in this world. Emphasis must be placed on these words. These faithful individuals, Abraham, Sarah, and their descendants, all passed away with their faith intact, never fully realizing the promises during their lifetimes never fully realizing the promises indeed. Before delving into the third promise, which is the promise of blessing for all nations, it is essential to highlight certain aspects of the first two promises. Firstly, it's important to note a conspicuous absence of something in the promises made to Abraham and his descendants. For example, there is no mention of any reward, hope, or opportunity for them to receive anything after their passing. Deceased individuals cannot lay claim to or own land, and certainly the multitude of faithful individuals referred to by the author of Hebrews cannot experience the blessings associated with inheriting the promised land in their current state of death. Secondly, it's crucial to emphasize that these promises do not contain any suggestion of an afterlife in heaven following death. In fact, the conclusion of the 11th chapter of Hebrews explicitly states this about all the faithful individuals who came before and have long since died. And all of these, having earned commendation through their faith, did not receive the promise as God has planned something superior for us, ensuring that their perfection would not be separate from ours. Hebrews 11:39 and 40. These promises, which we aim to demonstrate as undeniably foundational to Jesus' message of salvation, hinge entirely on the requirement of being physically alive, to receive them. 
They cannot be acquired when one is dead or disembodied. Keep these thoughts in mind as we'll discuss it more in future installments of this series. The third promise, the promise of blessing to all nations, is the most fascinating promise. Most people have difficulty conceptualizing non-Hebrew peoples as having any claim to the promises made to the patriarch of the Hebrew people. Even the Jews in Jesus' day could not stomach the idea. In fact, the Apostle Peter had to learn a lesson about the acceptance of Gentiles into the church. See Acts 10, 9 through 48. Thus far, we've seen the promises were clearly intended for Abraham's descendants and not for everyone, everywhere. Yet there is a component of the promises that does include everyone, everywhere. Yahweh, God told Abraham in Genesis 22, 17 and 18, I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So is it referring to offspring in the plural or offspring in the singular? Surprisingly, it encompasses both interpretations. While the Genesis passage may appear somewhat ambiguous in its description, the New Testament offers us greater clarity and deeper insight into its intended meaning. The Apostle Paul, in his letter to the Galatians, Galatians 3, 7 through 9, enlightens us. Understand, then, that those who are of faith are children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. How are all nations blessed through Abraham? The Apostle Paul again clarifies the original promise in Galatians 3.16. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offspring, not referring to many, but referring to one and to your offspring, who is Christ. If you've listened to part one of this series, you may recall we asked you to keep in mind the fact that offspring is singular in both Hebrew and English and dependent upon the context can mean one or more than one. Here, Paul clearly views at least one aspect of the promise of offspring to Abraham as meaning one single individual, Jesus. In Paul's view, it would not necessarily be through the Hebrew people as a whole that the nations would be blessed, but through the one man, Jesus Christ. This certainly puts Romans 9, 6, and 7 into better context. But it is not as though the word of God has failed, for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. But through Isaac shall your offspring be named. That offspring spoken of here was Jesus. The Hebrew people, who are often referred to as Jews today, undeniably played a pivotal role in bringing forth the Messiah and Savior to the world. For instance, the Apostle Paul, in Romans 3, 1 through 2, asserts, What advantage, then, is there in being a Jew, or what value is there in circumcision? Much in every way. First of all, the Jews were entrusted with the very words of God. Jesus also highlighted the significance of the Jewish heritage when speaking to the Samaritan woman in John 4.22, saying, You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. It is essential to acknowledge that without the Jewish people, including the prophets, patriarchs, the law of Moses, and the preservation of Abraham's family lineage dating back over 2,000 years before the birth of Jesus, his appearance in world history would have been impossible. In addition to the very obvious statement God made to Abraham, And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. The Old Testament also provides clues and hints of salvation being offered to all peoples and nations. Isaiah 52.10, for example, says, Yahweh has bared his holy arm before the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Luke 3, 5 through 6 echoes this passage in Isaiah by saying this about the baptism of repentance. John the Baptist preached in advance of Christ's coming. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall become straight, and the rough places shall become level ways, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. 
John the Baptist served as the forerunner to Christ, the first to publicly acknowledge him as Israel's Messiah and proclaim him to be the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. His divine mission was that of a prophet entrusted with the message, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The scriptures affirm that John was the fulfillment of the prophecy in Isaiah, which declared, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Matthew 3, 2 and 3. As the one chosen to introduce the Savior to Israel and ultimately to the world, John the Baptist paved the way for all people, everywhere, to witness the salvation of God in the man Jesus. Jesus was a very human man whose familial lineage could be traced all the way back to Abraham. It is without coincidence that the Gospel according to Matthew opens with the words, The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham, in Matthew 1.1. 1, 1. This was a vital component of the Apostle Matthew's claim that Jesus was that promised offspring in whom all nations would be blessed. It mattered not whether anyone else in Israel could prove their genetic lineage was linked with Abraham. It did matter, however, that Jesus' lineage could be traced back to Abraham. As the Savior, not only of Israel, but also of the entire world, the divisions based on racial or ethnic differences would dissolve and fade away. When Jesus conversed with the Pharisee Nicodemus, his renowned quote in John 3.16 did not state, For God so loved Israel that he sent his only begotten Son. Instead, he declared, For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son. Furthermore, while Jesus initially came to his own people, the Israelites, God had already devised a plan to extend the message of salvation to everyone regardless of their background. This encompassed both Jews and Greeks, Israelites, and non-Israelites alike. In John 10:16, Jesus made a declaration stating, I have other sheep that are not of this fold. Them I also must bring in, and they will listen to my voice, so that there will be one flock and one shepherd. He conveyed this message to a gathering of Pharisees, and his intention was evident. He planned to reach out to those who were not part of the Israelite fold, gathering them into a unified flock. Ultimately, there would be a single undivided flock under the guidance of Jesus, the sole shepherd whose voice they would heed. In the New Testament, the gospel message was referred to as a mystery on several occasions. The Apostle Paul specifically terms it the mystery of Christ, in Ephesians 3, 4 through 6, where he writes, When you read this, you should be able to perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not disclosed to the people of earlier generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are joint heirs, members of the same body, and participants in the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Lastly, returning to a passage from the writings of the Apostle Paul, he addresses Israel's failure to acknowledge its Messiah and embrace the gospel message. In Romans 11, 11, and 12, he states, So I ask, did they stumble in order that they might fall? By no means. Rather, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles, so as to make Israel jealous. Now, if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their complete acceptance mean? The salvation offered to the world, which was not based upon the law of Moses, which came some 430 years after the promises were made to Abraham, came through a descendant of Abraham, his offspring, just as God had promised. Because of Israel's failure to recognize the Messiah, the salvation message went to the rest of the world. It was an opportunity never before given. And it was in this way that the promise made to Abraham, that in his offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, was fulfilled. Thank you for joining us for the third installment of the Abrahamic Promises as the Basis for the Gospel of the Kingdom. In part four, we will delve deeper into the future ramifications of the promises made by God to Abraham. Given that Abraham and his descendants have not yet seen the complete realization of these promises, we will explore when and how we can anticipate God fulfilling them. Additionally, now that the Gentiles have been incorporated, and it is now those of faith who are the sons of Abraham, 
no longer reliant on genetic or familial lineage, we will investigate how these promises extend to the Gentiles.